Good morning. Today is Tuesday, November 18th, 2003, and we're here to record the interview of our U.S. military veteran, John William Gaines. We are at the uh, Retired and Senior Volunteer Program at 16 931 19 Mile Road, Clinton Township, Michigan. Uh, my name is Jim Pachuki, and I'll be the interviewer today. Our videographer today is Joe Ramoj, and also in the room are John, uh, John's wife, Barbara Gaines, as well as Elizabeth Howard and Dolores Baumgarten of the RSVP program. John, we'd like to start this morning just by you giving us a little bit of background. You know, you're, uh, you know when you were born, your age, and uh, how you ended up your military service in terms of how long you were in, what, what branch of service, uh, and what rank you were when you uh, uh, were released from the service. So if you could start, we'd appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I was born in 1925 in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, when I was about four years old, our family moved to Detroit. And uh, I uh, spent the rest of my time in Detroit. I was um, drafted. I, would, I had to sign up for the uh, draft when I turned 18, which was 1943. And uh, I was deferred uh, for six months so I could graduate from high school. And on uh, graduating from high school, then I was in inducted in the, in the service. Which high school was it, John? Uh, this was St. Vincent. Uh, on the west side of Detroit, it's in, the, in the neighborhood of the uh, Tiger Stadium, where, and uh, right close to the Michigan Central Depot. And uh, uh, I was, um, let's see, I, uh, they were drafted? Uh, yeah, I was, I was given a choice of the branch of service I, I uh, wanted to go into at the time of being inducted, so I picked the Navy. Uh, I think primarily because my dad was in the Navy in the First World War. And uh, I uh, went to Great Lakes uh, for boot camp. And about three quarters of the way through boot camp, my brother, my older brother, came home from overseas. And he was going to uh, Air, Corps, Air Corps school. Mm -hmm. And he was delayed en route, so he was home. So I got a, an emergency leave from boot camp to go home and see him. Can, and, can you tell us where? You were inducted, uh, you know, was it Fort Wayne? Was it uh, the uh, building downtown? I, I can't recall offhand. Okay. There was a building down in Detroit. Uh, <laughs> right. And, uh, but that's where they, they handled the inductions. How'd you get to Great Lakes? Well, we took a train. They, uh, train. With, of course, uh, we gathered as, as a few, as several of the uh, uh, fellows that were drafted, uh, gathered, and then we were all transported to the Great Lakes on a train mm -hmm. through Chicago and so forth. Who so was at the uh, train station to uh, bid you farewell? Well, I, I'm pretty sure my folks were there, you know. And, uh, so, um, but we, um, then I, uh, as I was saying about, uh, I was at the emergency leave, I uh, went back to, to boot camp because I had to finish up my boot training and then I would be transferred over to uh, OGU, which was outgoing unit. That's, uh, and I was destined to go to radio school. And, uh, but uh, in the meantime, they misplaced my records. And uh, so I was kind of delayed in that because of that. Mm -hmm. So I went to uh, radio school in the uh, University of uh, Wisconsin in, uh, in Milwaukee. And uh, spent, I think, probably eight or ten weeks there, I presume, for uh, in training. And then uh, I was sent overseas. We went, uh, were transferred to uh, California. We went uh, to we were Treasure Island in, Cali in, uh, in California. And then from there, uh, we uh, uh, were put on board ship and we went to Esperito Santos in the, in the, uh, uh, in, uh, the New Hebrides Islands, and that's what was like a staging area. Were, yeah. was, were there any special memories you have of your boot camp or your training after boot camp? Anything 
special that happened or you liked or disliked? Well, um, in, in the boot camp, uh, no, that was just pretty much just an <laughs> ordinary mm -hmm. boot camp. And uh, um, I, don't, I don't recall anything out of the ordinary mm -hmm. there. And uh, so. What, uh, when you say you went to training, what did they teach you to do in, in Milwaukee? Well, uh, this was uh, taught how to uh, uh, listen and record uh, uh, Morse code. And uh, uh, I could type. I took typing in high school, so that was a help because uh, what they do is they teach you uh, by sound, not necessarily seeing a dot and a dash and reading that way. You heard. Uh, the dot and dash, you, da da. You see, this would be the sound that would come over the over the tape. You know, when they uh, were training you, and then you learn to type uh, as you heard these the sound. You learn to type these words, mm -hmm. uh, letter these letters, and uh, so uh, you know we passed through that part of it. And uh, so then when uh, we went overseas to Espirito Santos. Uh, there was uh, these. We were all on what they called uh, radio strikers, radio men strikers. Now we were uh, different from uh, technical radio. They had a radio tech school that they taught. They learned how to take care of radios, but we we were on the Morse code type of thing. Where is this Perito Santos? Uh, it's in the, in the uh, New Hebrides Islands, which is in the Southwest Pacific. It's. Uh, I would say probably near the near the Solomon Island group, and um, north of Australia, a little north of Australia, and um, um, so at Desperado Santos, we I spent about a month there, and uh, during that time uh, they would they would uh, call everybody out every morning. You had to had a report out on the on the grinder, they call a grinder in a big field mm -hmm. and so forth. And then they would read off names, 15 or 20 uh, radio strikers. Uh, I was at that time. I was a seaman, uh, a, a uh, seaman, seaman first class striker, and because I had gone through radio school, so uh, uh, they'd call up about 15 or 20 names, and that group would go to a particular island to relieve the people that were that were there, the, sa the sailors that were there. Mm -hmm. And this particular time that I wish my name was called, and it seems like the fellows that I went with were all around the same alphabet, you know, and uh, that's the way they kept everybody. But anyway, uh, so they were, um, we were all, we were assigned then to an island called Treasury Island, which is the Shortland, Shortland Islands. Now that was all in the Solomon Islands, mm -hmm. and uh, this this island I understand from reading about it was uh, taken back from the Japanese by the New Zealand uh, mm. army. And we had uh, like an advance, advance um, unit that went radio men and, and uh, uh, yeomen and stuff like that. They went with these troops as they landed uh, and to, and to take over the island. So we, we were sent to relieve those guys, you know, those radio men. And this was an island, and the, the radio shack was underground. Uh, the, uh, the, it was a dugout type of thing, and they had maybe a half a dozen radios in there. And you, uh, you copied, uh, copied what they call a fox broadcast. Uh, fox is the is an F, the letter F. And you say like, uh, um, let's see. Uh, well, anyway. Um, so the, the Fox broadcast meant that you you received it, but you didn't answer to it. And these were broad these broadcasts were from San Francisco and uh, Honolulu, and they were they just kept running these messages over and over. And what the, the your radio men do when you stand watch, you copy them. Uh, they had two or three fellows copying so that there would be no mistakes, and uh, and they keep running them over and over again. So that but and what they were were a series of groups of letters, uh, with, but 
not words. I mean, they were just just um, letters, and uh, you know, they take up a whole page, and they'd be grouped out, and 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 uh, and then, but they were, that was all coded. This was all coded message. The the uh, the the, part, the address of the message was that there were certain combination of letters that was uh, uh, meant for your information or your action, and uh, it was uh, the and, and in that address would be a code code of your uh, your ship. That, uh, the, one of the, the, the message would be for, for his information or just in his, or his action, and um, then of course these were then taken into the coding room and they decode the message and it would turn out in, in plain language and, and so. So you. So that was what. A, you, you were not involved in the decoding. No, that was done by uh, I think done by officers more than anything else. But anyway. Um, so this was would be the basic. When you stood watch, that's what you did. You you copied the Fox broadcast. Now in the islands, this was a there was a series of islands. Uh, ours was one of them, and these were like PT bases. And we had a small uh, landing strip there for airplanes, small airplanes. But uh, uh, so we were able to contact uh, these different. I, islands and do you remember, remember the names of any of those? Mono was one of the Mono was one of the islands, and uh, Treasury Island was uh, where I was, and but there was two or three others, and the, we passed information back and forth through them, and uh, this was done with the key, uh, it's just like a telegraph key, and uh, some of them had uh, high speed ones that had paddles uh, paddles on the side, and you you worked them. Like this, and dot dash, and dot dash, like that. So they could, you could send a message quite, quite fast. And uh, so um, uh, Bob Hope visited us on Treasury Island, <laughs> and uh, so that was quite a, quite a thrill, you know, to see him. Who, who was with him? Uh, Francis Langford and Jerry Colonna, and uh, I forget who else, but <laughs> I can't remember all of them. But uh, that was quite a program. And uh, when I was in uh, uh, in Madison, it was not in university, uh, we had a, a, a recreation program, and they had uh, a bo uh, they taught you boxing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the guys I was friends of mine, <laughs> uh, he uh, he talked me into boxing on Treasury Island. There they had before the movie they had these boxes boxing matches. So I, I fought in that one. I lost. <laughs> yeah, I run out of I run out of gas is what I did. <laughs> so so but that was a, an experience there. So then uh, I think we got a little restless and we wanted to change the scenery. So the three or four of us uh, put in for a transfer. As a matter of fact, that's what I would do every time I went to a, uh, a new assignment. The first thing I did was was uh, go in and put in, put in for a transfer. So that's why I did a lot of moving around. So what they did is they transferred us then to uh, Hollandia, New Guinea. And now this was, uh, MacArthur had gone from Corregidor, Corregidor to Australia, and it's where he was stationed at that time. And of course the, the Admiral of the Seventh Fleet, which was Kincaid, Admiral Kincaid, was with him in Australia. And then what they did is they moved that headquarters into to Hollandia, New Guinea. Now that's just just north of uh, I think it's north of uh, of Australia. And uh, this was all in, it was all uh, just an island there. And uh, so there was all radio com communications. And so we spent uh, I spent about a month and a half there. And then. Uh, got uh, edgy feet again, and I want, we wanted some sea duty, I believe, at that time. So what they did then is they, they um, assigned us to uh, the, uh, at, uh, New Guinea was, was the commander of the serv Seventh Service Squadron uh, in the Southwest Pacific. They called that the Comsaransa Wetpack, or 
Commander Service Squadron, West Pacific, so Southwest Pacific. And um, that was what we were. We were then in that, uh, uh, assigned to them, the Commander of the Service Squadron. So what we did then is from that point on, we just traveled aboard ship as passengers. We weren't assigned to any duties aboard at these ships that we were on. Well, in the meantime, we had to get there, so we were placed on the, uh, uh, the USS New Louisville, which was a, we considered a, uh, a uh, what would they call it? Well, it was a cruiser, and, uh, but it was a heavy, heavy cruiser. Heavy that's cruiser. what it is. And, and uh, the Boise was a light cruiser. That was it. But anyway. Why did you mention the Boise? Well, the Boise will come up next. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but it's just to describe the difference between the two okay. ships. Uh, we sailed on the Louisville en route to get to, now at this time, we had, uh, the, uh, America had taken over uh, Leyte in the Philippines. And that's where the Nashville was, that's what it was. The Nashville, uh, you know it says Nashville, was the flagship of the Commander Service Squadron at that time. And who, do you remember who that was? Well, the commander, no, but the, it was in Kincaid's, uh, okay. his, his, uh, his, his uh, Responsibility, but um, so in route to get it to get to the Nashville, we were aboard the Louisville, and this is uh, some of the experience there was when they they would catapult the uh, they had, they had a seaplane a seaplane aboard the ship, and what they would do is they'd, they'd shoot it off on a catapult, and this would be for pulling targets for target practice or for observation of uh, the enemy, you know, and, uh, and uh, scouting out the enemy. And now to get them back, to get the, the plane back on board ship, uh, they would, the, the ship would come into, into, the, into the wind, and they had a boom out the side of the ship, and they put a cable down with a net that they would drag along in the water, and this plane would come around and, and hit the, the, the water and then bounce, and they had a hook on the, on the pontoon, the bottom of the pontoon, and that would hook into this net, and that, and then they cut the engines, and then a cable would come down and grab the ship or the plane and pick it up and put it back on the board ship. And they used to have a contest as to who could get that plane up out of the water and, and uh, on deck the quickest. So that was quite an experience to see that go on. So then we, um, we finally got to, uh, we stopped on our way at, in, uh, I think in the Bougainville area. And that was all, these are all Solomon Island areas. And uh, uh, there was a, um, uh, we, we tied up alongside the California, which was a battleship, and they trained, changed skippers there. And so that delayed us a while. So by the time we got to Leyte to pick up the Nashville, uh, she had gone out on a, uh, a maneuver to Mandaro uh, and was hit by a, by a kamikaze plane and the radio shack was obliterated. Mm -hmm. So we missed that, you know, well, it was with us. <laughs> so uh, then they, uh, they, they commissioned then the Boise, which was another sh uh, light cruiser, as the flagship for the commander of the Second Fleet, the service squadron. So then um, that was, uh, MacArthur then went aboard that ship, and this was the, the uh, uh, Lingayen, Gulf operation, which was to take, to capture, recapture Manila, which was the capital of the Philippine Islands. And we'd already taken Leyte, but uh, it was my understanding by reading this book, I had this book with uh, General MacArthur, and I'll, I'll read uh, a little short excerpt from it. Oh, please do. Yeah. But anyway, this, uh, they, the powers that be in Washington, I presume, I, I understand, had decided to bypass the Philippines. Manila, no, uh, Luzon Island, but MacArthur, you know, he, he made a promise to the people that he would come back and, and save them. And of course, of course, it was these prisoners that they had in uh, Corregidor were uh, still still captured. I mean, they were still in uh, prisoners, so he wanted to get them released. So anyway, so this this is a uh, an excerpt from this his biography, which is titled "Old Soldiers Never Die." And as a matter of fact, it's in the Library of Congress, I understand this book. 
Uh, it says here, the voyage to Luzon aboard the cruiser Boise was like the famous medieval military punishment running the gauntlet. The closer the invasion convoy drew to Linge and Gulf, the greater the number of kamikazes. Admiral Kenny, that was the admiral of the 7th Fleet, and the Navy had devised an air plan to have 60 fighters on combat air patrol over the fleet from dawn to dusk. Now this was on the way from, from Leyte up and around the Horn and up into the Gayan area. But some suicide pilots were certain to pierce even the, this strong umbrella. MacArthur watched the action from the ship's rail. At other times, he stood next to a gun turret, fascinated at the sight of Japanese pilots plunging into black walls of exploding any aircraft fire, like carrion, trying to batten a, uh, on a field mice. On field mice, on the four-day voyage north of north, one of Admiral Kincaid's six baby flat tops went down, and two more were seriously damaged. Kamikazes exploded into the bridges of two battleships, and five cruisers were struck. Torpedoes were fired at the Boise by midget uh, it, it, it submarine, uh, but they missed, as did a bomb dropped by a Japanese dive bomber who had taken aim at it. So it was quite a trip. I happened to be on mid-watch when we were, we were underway or coming into the Linge and Gulf area. What so is mid-watch, well, mid-watch was uh, the, from 12 to, to uh, 12 to 4 in the morning or something okay. like that. I think it was four hours on and eight hours off, something like that, that you stood watch aboard the ship or in the radio shack. And, uh, but I happened to be sleeping when a lot of this was going on. However, I heard, I woke up and I heard all this noise. So I went above, opened the hatch and went, up, went, up, went out on the deck. Everything was exploding, and of course I didn't have a. I was just riding along, you know, as a passenger, so I didn't have any battle station or anything like that. But it got pretty epic, so I went back down below. <laughs> but, but you actually were on deck during kamikaze attacks? Well, uh, no, I don't. I don't believe. I don't think I was on uh, on deck that long. Okay. So. But it was uh, quite an experience to see just where it was. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so so then we. Uh, we understand we cruise around for a while, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, just uh, checking things out. And so we were, uh, I think they left MacArthur off there on uh, Lingayen, and then we went back to uh, a, a, an island called, the, well, Tolosa Leyte, which was in the Philippine Island. That was near, near uh, uh, Leyte, uh, Leyte. And we spent about two and a half months there. Now this all took place, it was a, the 15-day trip on the Louisville, and then the Boise was, was on there for one month. And uh, that was right around my birthday when I was, uh, I turned 21, I think, or something at that time, or 20. So, uh, and then uh, from there then I was transferred to the, Boy to the uh, San Clemente, which was a converted seaplane tender. Now that was a, was a ship that uh, uh, took care of uh, repair work on seaplanes and stuff like that. And they converted it to a communication ship. Now they put down in the, like the hangar deck, they put all kinds of radios in there and they air conditioned it because you had to keep air conditioning for the radio, the, the heat from the radios and stuff like that. So that was a hell. But uh, I remember that it was, you know, everybody smoked. And uh, the place was just nothing. There was no ventilators. <laughs> so, and then uh, they also built like a big, uh, structure on, on, the, on the main deck uh, for officers' quarters, because we had a lot of officers aboard that ship because it was a command post-like. And so I spent about six months on that ship, and uh, shortly after I got, got aboard, I got to know a, a fellow that uh, uh, put out the newspaper aboard the ship. So Do you remember I, his name? No, not, I don't remember that guy's name. <laughs> uh, but he was transferred shortly after and uh, I became the editor of the newspaper then, see. Mm -hmm. so, but this was just a matter of uh, getting the news. Uh, you'd go ashore in Manila and get uh, the uh, news published from the, with the Army. You know, they'd have all the n current news. And then come back and we'd type it on a uh, stencil and then run it off on a mimeograph machine and then pass them out to the troops. And uh, 
so then I got a, a young fellow that uh, his name was Doug Hanson. He he helped me with it. He was a pretty good artist, so he do all the graphics on this thing. So so we had quite an operation going there. So we had our own quarters. So and um, so that took up a little more. You know, helped pass the time. Then. So, so then uh, the war was over, and. Uh, so what happened then is they uh, began to dismantle all of these these uh, um, temporary commands, and the uh, admirals went down to commanders, and they all dropped back to their original rank, uh, as uh, you know that they had before the war. So then they would dis dis disband the command. So of course in the meantime I had transferred into ship's company because that to get this job as an editor. See? So then uh, uh, I figured, well, they're, they're disbanding the uh, flag, so I didn't want to spend any more time there. So I got transferred back into the flag, and then, I, of course, I got the chance to go home then. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we uh, sailed back to the States, uh, and we landed in, uh, in uh, San Diego. And then, uh, I called home and I uh, told them that I was in the States, but I didn't know when I would, you know, come, come inland, and I, I wanted to surprise them, so, so I got on the train and it took us, you know, a couple of days to get there, so I get into Chicago and then I transferred to the train in Detroit. Now, we lived about four or five blocks from the railroad station, and we used to walk, we could walk there. What street did you live on? I lived on Vermont Street, mm -hmm. and uh, just off of Michigan Avenue. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, that was where uh, the Tigers used to come in on the train, Geringer and Greenberg and these guys. And they were in the cars, and as they drove by the side street, they'd have to stop for the traffic, and we would stand on the corner and watch them through the window in the car, see all the ball players. But anyway, getting back to the story. So uh, I come into the, the my, my, we live close enough that my dad used to go over every once in a while and because we had a lot of neighbor kids and friends that, uh, that were coming in from the war then and so he enjoyed going over there and watching these guys come in. So I remember uh, walking up the ramp with my seat bag and everything on it and I hear him yell out my name. <laughs> so uh, it was quite a thrill. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, were you, uh, well, when was this that you... This you was, uh, well, let's see, this was, uh, I really don't have it on here somewhere, well, I believe it was sometime in 1946. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 With the one I was what was that? Uh, well, actually, what happened is, uh, I came home, and then I had to go back to Great Lakes to be yeah. discharged, because I really didn't have enough points. See, if, 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 you, uh, if you were married and or over a certain age, you had enough points to get out right away. Well, I was uh, just a young fellow, you know, 21 years old and not enough, that much time in uh, service. So uh, I had to go back there for maybe two or three weeks. And as a matter of fact, I remember I, I uh, had to have a wisdom tooth pulled, so that delayed me getting home <laughs> again. So, so uh, but that's uh, that was in yeah that was in '46, and uh, I was I was then discharged on in March March of '46. So uh, uh, when after you were at Great Lakes and then you went to Milwaukee for training yeah not radio school how'd you get out to the to the West Coast? Well, we took a train. It took, and, a train. Uh, it took quite a while because uh, it was a troop train type of thing, mm -hmm. and we'd be sidetracked for a while till the main went on through or something like that. And uh, it'd be crowded, and we used to sleep, you know, on, on, up in the uh, we had just the, the uh, coach, you know, you no no sleeping mm -hmm. uh, deal. So we used to sleep up in where the rack, the the luggage rack, rack was, you know, you take turns going up there and napping. So, <laughs> so, but it was. Uh, a bit of a drive. Were, were the cars heated? And at what time of year did you do this? Uh, let's see. I was in radio school through the winter. Um, I was uh, there through Christmas, so it was after that. So probably in the early, early uh, spring, if not 
February or something like that, you know. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Where the Carl Rolls Royce was, uh, May, 4th, May 4th, I was in the New Hebrides. April 18th, we left uh, for Alameda, Alameda, California. Okay. Aboard a merchant ship called the Mormon McTurn. It was about 250 guys aboard ship. And uh, these were mostly radio strikers, as I said, and uh, there were some Marines on board and so forth. So that's where we went from home to Esperito Santos in the New Hebrides. And uh, we got there about May, uh, May the 4th, in 1944. So that was about 15, 16 days on board ship there. So uh, how was that trip? Well, uh, just ordinary. I, uh, there was no excitement uh, to speak of. No we storms weren't attacked or, or anything. <laughs> no, no storms or anything? That, uh, well, it had some heavy seas, sure. Yeah. Oh, did yeah. that affect you at all? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I never did get seasick. Mm -hmm. uh, even on the way home there, and there, there was a, we were on a troop ship, which is it's what's considered a flat bottom, and it rolled and pitched quite a bit. So, but if you stayed in the center of the ship and down below decks, it wasn't too bad. So, um, but we. Um, what is that you're reading from, John? Well, this is a letter that I wrote right after the war, because the censors, uh, with censorship was lifted, and uh, I was able to tell my folks where I had been all along. And I, so I wrote I uh, wrote them this letter. This was dated September the 5th, 1945, and it was from uh, uh, Manila, uh, aboard the ship uh, San Clemente. And uh, I explained where, had, I, where I was and, and uh, with who, you know, a couple of the guys and so forth. And um, can we make a copy of that for the yeah, record? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd appreciate that. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, it's about. Okay. So uh, once you got off and you you were at Treasure Island and so forth, and you eventually got to the Boise. When you were on the Boise, mm -hmm. uh, did you ever see General MacArthur? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, he was. He was around. Uh, I watched him go ashore. I watched him from uh, above the quarter deck where him and his entourage uh, left the ship. Now, I understand he waited ashore there, too, like he did in in, uh, in, Luz in um, Leyte. He waited ashore twice. <laughs> so, uh, according to that book uh, I read, you know, I, can, I didn't see him but wait ashore because I was ship. But uh, yeah, he was around. Uh, he, not for, he didn't see him too much. See a lot of his entourage, you know, and people that were right close to him. So, but no, most of it was, uh, you know, standing watch and uh, and. Uh, How was the food on a uh, uh, a ship like that? Good. I, I thought it was good. You know, they, uh, uh, there was some during the heavy seas. You had to be careful. You know, the garbage cans in, in the mess hall there, and of course if any of them broke loose, they'd start moving, and, and, you know, <laughs> so you had to be careful of those, so, but if they'd lash, they'd lash them down pretty good. So, uh, but it was quite exciting, it, the ship would pitch and then it would dive into the water and come up, and it, was, it was really impressive, you know. What kind of personal space did you have on, on a ship like Not that? much, not much personal space. Uh, we slept in a uh, bunk area where they the tiers that the beds were tiered, yeah, about four high. And uh, I remember, uh, like aboard the uh, the uh, uh, San Clemente, I was there for six months. And uh, so, as the longer you stayed there, and the guys were transferring out and so forth, the higher up in this la in this bunk beds you'd go. Because up on top there was where the vents were, and that's what blew the nice cool air. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was a choice spot, being up in that top bunk with his. And so you used to put your pant, pants over it, tie them down, and you have two legs that you could, you know, direct the wind in different directions. Oh, you know? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> a little ingenuity. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, 
word. Now, well, let me, let me sure. the, we had a, um, a recreation leaves once in a while or, or uh, a go on liberty that's for a, a brief time and uh, leave was considered a long, longer period of time. But anyway, uh, when, the when we were aboard ship, we went to an island, um, I, f I forget what, Tulagi or something like that, uh, where was uh, baseball diamonds and stuff. So we would go there they take us off the ship and on a uh, uh, landing barge and, and take us ashore. And they would give us two bottles of beer, two warm bottles of beer on board ship. And then when you get there, you tra change those for cold beer. So, but I remember uh, the one time I, I got heat exhaustion so bad, I almost, I really almost died, mm -hmm. according to the, the uh, corpsman, that I, the, the uh, guys who worked in the hospital. And uh, they brought me back and uh, they put me in bed and, and uh, iced me with uh, yeah, iced, uh, iced alcohol and uh, to get my temperature down. And so that was quite a good experience. What, what caused you to have? Well, this was the heat, primarily the heat. Uh, on ship or off? Uh, uh, well, both. Because it was hot. You know, this was a, not too far from the equator. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, on Treasury Island, I got a pretty bad case of, of, of uh, fungus in my feet. Was, everything grows there, you know, and uh, uh, you just, you just have, that's part of the problems that you run into there, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we used to go play ball over there. And that was one of the times that, that didn't work out. So. <laughs> that, uh, well, what other sports of anything? Did uh, the troops at that time, you know, participate? Well, pretty much that was all it was. Uh, Generally baseball? Do, yeah. mm -hmm. Baseball. Um, mm, I think they, somebody had boxing. Some mm -hmm. ships had boxing, I guess. But uh, I, I didn't get involved in any of that. I mean, uh, on any of the ships you were on, were there ever any casualties? I know I hate to ask well, that. Well, uh, one, one was an accident that happened, and this was uh, a, a junior officer, I think, that uh, had been on shore, and uh, I don't know if you, I call it, you recall this boom that, that used to stick out from the ship there. Well, they used to tie the, uh, the uh, rig, or the captain's gig on that to take the people back and forth. And then whenever they wanted to, this would be the ship sitting in the harbor. And uh, this was on the uh, San Clemente. And uh, what would happen is uh, the, uh, the uh, coxswain, who was the driver of the, the boat, he would bring people over to the gang gangway and they'd go up the ladder. Mm -hmm. And then they'd take the boat over and park and, and tie it to this boom and then walk up a, 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 a rope ladder to the boom and then across. Mm -hmm. Now this, you know, it was just about 15, 20 feet or more, maybe a little bit more. It was just the distance from the, from the deck of the ship to the water was what it was. And so with, instead of dropping this guy off at the, uh, at the gangway, he decides he wants to get off with the, you know. And in the meantime, we're sitting on the top of this, this, built, this deck that they built for the officer's quarters we had, the, that's where we saw the movies. They had a, on the fan tail, on the back at the bottom of the back of the ship, they had a movie screen. And then they put chairs up on the top and then we'd watch the movie. And this was like in, at dusk, just before the movie started. So we're all sitting on deck here, on this top of this deck. And this guy gets on, walks up the ladder, gets on and he's waving to everybody and he fell off. And he fell down and he fell on, in, on the gunnel, on, on the boat that was down there, and he broke his back, and I understand he died, so, so this is what happens sometimes, you know, so. When uh, you were in it, I forget if it was the Boise or the next, yeah. and you, you went on deck that one time, during an attack, and then you went back down. Yeah. What was it like to be in the bowels of a ship when you knew what was going on? Well, really, you know, 
you got to understand, I was 18 or 19 years old. Uh, I was afraid, you know, I mean, I suppose there was a certain amount of fear involved. Um, but uh, it, it, just, it just happens, and, you, and you're there. I was, you know, quite upset about her, you know, quite uh, um, concerned when I went on, when I went up on top, on top deck. Uh, and, but the noise is just, just unbelievable, the, and, the, and the percussion from those guns of shooting because they were shelling the beach at the time, and uh, uh, there was a, a bit of airplanes up, you know, but not too much. And uh, but that 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 rick, you know concussion from the, uh, the these guns that they were shooting, and also on the Louisville, which had bigger guns, uh, it just was unbelievable. The feelings that you get, it just shakes your whole inside just listening to them, you know. So uh, it was, and then the ship would tip with them as they recoil, you know. So uh, it was something to see, that's for sure. You know, uh, you know for most of us, we'll never experience any of the mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you see it in the movies and you just mm -hmm. wonder. Is it is it realistic what they're showing? That's well, pretty much so, pretty much so. But you can't replace that the personal experience. And the guys that were shooting the you know the machine guns and stuff at the planes, that was you know they were uh, all strapped in and, and moving them, and, and, uh, and these guns were going off, and, and they're all going off, and everything is booming and banging there, and it gets it gets to be quite a the, the, uh, site. Do you uh, you did get into Manila? Pardon me? You were in Manila? Yeah. Mm -hmm. at, uh, oh yeah. You know, towards yeah. The we went on uh, we went on leave there in Manila uh, from uh, from the uh, San from the San Clemente, and uh, it was pretty well beat up. They had bombed it, and uh, because the Japanese had held out quite a bit, quite a bit there, you know, and uh, so a lot of the buildings were blown apart, you know, so just like Germany and wherever, you know, and uh, so, but uh, I met a few of my friends, you know, from school that, that uh, uh, a fellow by the name of Joe Saunders, I graduated from high school with him, and we went into service together, but he was put into a different uh, boot company, and uh, so I lost track of him there, but I run into him in Manila, so that was oh, quite yeah, an experience, yeah. you know. So, uh, Did you ever come face to face with any Japanese of any sort? No, no. We had no, we wouldn't, uh, you know, we weren't in, uh, they didn't have any prisoners aboard the ship or anything like that. Mm -hmm. No, the Filipinos, you know. So. Did they welcome you when you? Oh, sure, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I know a few of them here that were there. Okay. Well, of course, they're still, they were young, they were babies. <laughs> And, uh, but it's interesting to talk to him, you know. The, uh, and how long were you in Manila? Or that was um, just on a, on a Liberty? Uh, well, pardon me? That was just on a Liberty that you Yeah, you'd go there for just a, just the day. Okay. And then you'd come back in the evening. And uh, there really wasn't much to do. You know, they'd have a couple bars and stuff like that. But you'd walk, walk the streets and, and there really wasn't much. Uh, as I, I recall, there was nothing spectacular about it. And uh, we go maybe three or four at a time, and, you know, with the, get, with the, the uh, fellows that you went around with, you know. And uh, they would take turns, the, what they could call port and starboard leave, would, uh, the port would go on that one side of the ship, they'd all go on leave, and then, and then the next day, starboard would go. And that's the way they would divide up. So. You know, not everybody on the ship went at the same time. How was the rumor, the, what? the, the rumor mill on the ships? I've, I've often wondered, yeah. you know, the war in Europe ended before yeah. the, the war in oh, yeah. uh, on the Pacific. Mm -hmm. When the war in Europe ended, what did you folks who were in the Pacific, what, what were you thinking? Well, it, I think it ended uh, close by, you know, the, what was that in uh, about 40, 45, wasn't it? Right, but it was, yeah. you know, a number yeah. of months earlier. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Um, I don't recall anything special. I think we were glad, of course, you know, that, uh, and uh, so then they would step up the uh, Pacific campaign right. and see this was a kind of a holding and then gradually moving uh, type of campaign. Then, they, they, of course, when that war was over, then they concentrated all their efforts in the Pacific then. So there was more ships and more, uh, uh, you know, more action then. Um, what was the largest convoy that you can remember being a part of? Or well, I think that was the convoy that went to uh, Bengay and Gulf. So yeah, Bengay because Gulf. you had a lot of different ships there. The, they had carriers and, and uh, it was a Halsey, you know, his carriers and Nimitz. And, uh, um, but when we were going in the Louisville, I suppose we'd have escort, you know, pers uh, uh, destroyers and, and things like that around us and uh, for protection. But it all depends on it, how much danger you were in, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know. So you get used to it. You get used to the routine, and uh, and of course it gets kind of boring sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. so nothing to do. <laughs> when uh, when the bomb was dropped on Japan, mm -hmm. yeah, you were still out in, in the Pacific. Yeah, we were in Manila then. Mm -hmm. the time. How was that announced to you folks, sir? How were you? Made well, you really that? had no concept of what it was. I presume. I think that's was that was the answer to it. We. We didn't realize uh, what what it was about, and uh, you don't get newspapers there with the big splashy headlines and stuff, you know. So you get just just whatever comes over the wires and whatever they want to tell you. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, you know, I I'm sure that we were glad to, to, to see. Well, of course, the war wasn't over at that point until later, a little later on, uh, but uh, uh, but it was a result of that. I think the war was ended uh, quicker. So, uh, but as far as any personal uh, reaction to it, is, uh, I can't say that I had anything that stands out in my mind. Mm -hmm. How, when, when you came back, it was by true ship, by, by ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, uh, they, uh, it was a troop ship, uh, and they used to call them Liberty ships, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, so they, uh, that was that was a, a rough uh, trip, you know, on the weather and stuff like that. So it took us about, probably about 15 days, to 15 days to come. And uh, um. right, take. do we have another one? that it was kind of a rough trip back in, the, in the Yeah, we had a few uh, rough days on the water and uh, the ship lost and turned and, uh, and uh, but uh, that, that was something that you weathered and uh, it worked out okay. Okay, and you got back to San Diego. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> then hopped the train and came back to yeah. Chicago mm -hmm. and then Detroit. Mm -hmm. Uh, what'd you do when you got back to Detroit? Well, you go visit your friends and, uh, and just you know, hang around. So, you know. uh -huh. And uh, but like I say, it was probably I had about a ten-day leave or something like that, and then I had to report back. But what happens is I go back and I forgot my papers. I would see I was carrying my own papers there because I was on my own at this point, and uh, so I left them at home and forgot to bring them. So that delayed it few days, so I had to have my folks mail them to some fella that I, I got his address who was who was stationed right there at Great Lakes. So uh, he, uh, he uh, I have to tell you a story about uh, when I was getting ready to go to radio school, like I said, I was delayed because of my brother, and then I went home and I had to go back to boot camp and so forth. And uh, so I'm not, pretty soon I'm the only one left in this barracks because everybody took off. They went to radio school or gunnery school or whatever. And so this, that, there was a, an old salt that uh, was coming in from overseas and he was 
put in the same barracks. And so we got to talking, and he said, you know, he says, you can be here for the rest of the war. They, they, they lost you. <laughs> so I wanted to, but at the time, I wanted to, I was there probably uh, two or three weeks, and I, I got a little antsy, so I, I wanted to, so I wanted to go home, so sure. I, I uh, but in order to get a, a, a leave, I had to take a leave because that was Detroit, you know, I was part of ways. Sure. And uh, so I had a, I had to report in the uh, lieutenant to get a, to get a, a permission or get a, a leave. And of course, then they interview you, and they thought they thought I was waiting for a commission or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, because there was a lot of radio schools around, there was no no problem with getting me into a school. Mm -hmm. But it was because my records were lost. That's what it was. So they gave me the leave, and then uh, when I got back, they sure got got rid of me then. You know. mm -hmm. So then I, that's when I went to Madison, Wisconsin. So. Okay. Uh, when you got back to Detroit, yeah. I'll all finished with the service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what what happened? Direction to the rest of your life. Go. Well, um, I had before I went in the service uh, when I was in high school, um, the uh, pastor of our of our church, he uh, knew uh, a friend down that, that worked for the county, Wayne, Wayne County Road Commission. And uh, we were, uh, so we were playing ball one time over in the neighborhood there, and he came, the priest came by and he asked us if we wanted to go, to, wanted a job. But we had, uh, I, had all, I had graduated from high school in June, and uh, they hadn't said it, they didn't call me up yet. But I said, okay, so we'll get this job. And uh, uh, we work one week and I get my induction papers. So, so I have to leave them. Mm -hmm. So when I come back, I went and got my job back. And I worked there for 30 years. What kind of job was this? Pardon me? What kind of job was it? Well, I started out as a rodman. In the field with an engineer, with engineers, and you hold the rod and read the readings mm. and stuff like that. And uh, then I, I, uh, I, I could type. I could type, so that was a plus. Mm -hmm. sure. And one day, we we're during the winter months. We would uh, uh, have a downtime. We wouldn't be out in the weather too much, and then work stopped and stuff like that, pretty much. So uh, the boss says. Uh, we were standing around waiting to be assigned to what we were going to do for that day. So he comes out and he said, anybody here can type? Well, not, and as a matter of fact, incidentally, this, this place where we were, the uh, officer that shot where we were, was in Wayne, Michigan. We had to take a bus all the way from Detroit to Wayne, Michigan every morning. So anyway, he said, anybody can type? And so I raised my hand. So he said, well, next, you know, on Monday, you report down in Detroit. Uh, downtown at the, at the Barlam Tower, so that's where I went. And so I got involved in the land and legal department mm -hmm. there. And uh, we, this was when they were building all of the freeways in Wayne County. And uh, so I was assigned to work with this fellow as property management. Mm -hmm. And what we would do is when we bought a piece of a house, we would temporarily rent it. And this time, rents were real scarce because it was right after the war and so forth. And uh, so uh, we would rent these houses temporarily until until they needed to tear them down or move them for the construction of the freeways. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, that's where I worked. And I worked there for maybe a year or so. And when winter, when summer came, I thought, well, I want to go back out in the field. Because I was a young fellow, you know, I didn't want to put that office and stuff. So, uh, I went back out in the field. So then, when because uh, I was a right, uh, I was a uh, rodman. That was my classification. And uh, so then, when uh, I think I spent another year out there, and then finally, then uh, my boss that I had in the in the uh, property management division, he wanted me back in if I wanted to come in. So I I said okay. So I went back to work there. And then I became a, 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 rod, a, a right away agent. They call it a right away agent. And we handled all the rents of all of the people and, uh, and rented the property, advertised it, and rent the property temporarily. And then 
when the t game time to construct in a particular area, then we would let, let out contracts for houses to be torn down or moved. And there was a lot of houses that were real nice houses that people uh, contracted and picked them up and moved them. And of course, they had moving contractors who, who would buy a series of houses and then sell them and move them to a uh, uh, bigger lot somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's what I, I did. I eventually became the supervisor of that property management when my boss retired. This is still with Wayne County? This is with Wayne County, Wayne County Road Commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as a consequence, we built all of the freeways in Wayne County. That was quite an experience. So and when did the lovely Barbara yeah. come into the picture? Oh. Well, that was, uh, <laughs> well, uh, this was after the war, and uh, there was, a, at our church, we had a young young people's group, and uh, they had a bowling league. So uh, we both joined it, but I didn't know, know her at the time. And as a matter of fact, she, she was a friend of a girl, that was a, a friend of a friend type of thing, and she worked with a, uh, a girl uh, that belonged to this league. And so she belonged to the league too. So uh, when I, I was I was playing softball pretty pretty heavy, so I broke my leg sliding in the home one one deal. So I was on the crutches. So I had to drop out of the bowling league. But then when my leg healed up, I went back and they put me on the same te same team as she was on. So I was smitten. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, so we got together, and uh, yeah, one, one, one thing led to another. Now, I have to tell you that I was, um, right after I left the service, or it was uh, uh, discharged, I thought, well, you know, I did, uh, I'd like the Navy, so I joined the reserves and uh, for four years. So I was spent a couple of days there, or a couple of meetings, and uh, so that didn't work out too good, so I decided that quit. Well, you don't quit. They just drop you into, into uh, hunting, uh, what do they call it? Uh, well, you but yeah. But, but anyway, so uh, of course now, <coughs> now the Korean War starts and uh, I didn't want to get into that, but uh, I, had all, I had signed up so they sent me a notice to report and uh, we pushed the wedding, our wedding up a few months to uh, so we could get married. And uh, my brothers had a, uh, had a, st a stag party for me. And uh, the day of that stag party, I got a telegram from the Navy Department saying that uh, they didn't have, I didn't have enough time to warrant them calling me back in. So that was quite a, quite a happy experience there. <laughs> so, happy party. Oh, overall, how do you feel about your service and well, the I, military? I'm glad, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to do it. Uh, and uh, it, uh, I had no regrets. It was, of course, it was a time of life when, you know, you weren't, you were settled down, or you weren't settled down yet, and so forth. So I would imagine it would be tougher on a person that would have family or something like that. But uh, I was on, the, you know, on the loose, and uh, so uh, it, as far as I was concerned, you just do as you're told, and you know, everything would work out. So. Uh, so as a matter of fact, we had five. We have five children, and they, uh, and we have ten grandchildren, and we have now one great grandson, and with another one coming up shortly, I uh, wrote June, and uh, so uh, that's something to look forward to. Then, after you uh, were, you know, discharged, did you participate in any veterans organizations or? No, I didn't. I didn't join any. Uh, uh, my dad belonged to the American Legion, and uh, uh, but uh, no, I didn't. Uh, did you go to any reunions, or did anybody? Well, no. See, usually uh, the reunions are with you spending all your mm -hmm. career with the same guys at the same place right. and so forth. And I did a lot of chase, you know, jumping around. So right. uh, other than the, those guys from Cleveland. There was three of them from Cleveland that I hung around with most of the time, and we, they were all radio men. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, right after after the war was over, after we got out of the service, I went there and visited them. They, they got together themselves in Cleveland, 
and then I, I was there a couple times and, and uh, visited with them, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, but other than that, that's uh, that's uh, my time. Okay. Well, is there anything else you'd like to put in the record uh, you know, about that experience here? How you feel about the military? Or no, I. Uh, any, uh, any more stories to tell us? No. <laughs> No, I think that's that's just about all. I think. Okay. Uh, will you allow us to make copies yeah. of mm -hmm. these? Uh, I sure. So they, mm -hmm. they can go along with your interview. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to present you with your pen for oh. uh, participating in the Veterans Fine. History. For, uh, thank you very much for uh, participating, mm -hmm. and to thank you for your service. Sure. Oh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So. If anybody else has nothing to say, we shall uh, say it's an interview. Good. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Yeah.